is a happy coincidence as we continue our series Rooted in Love. Last week I asked you to look at your feet to see where they were rooted, especially in stressful moments. A little boy was born on this day back in 1921 in Ithaca, New York, while his father was attending Cornell. They moved to Henning, Tennessee, where he discovered a love of storytelling. He would sit on their porch with his mouth open in awe, listening to his venerated grandfather tell with a measured cadence the stories that had come down through their ancestors. When his grandfather died, he remembered running down the street to tell his father the sad news with this African proverb that his grandfather had taught him on his mind. When an old person dies, it is as if a library has burned to the ground. I'm sure many of us have felt that, wishing we could rehear stories from our grandparents or our great-grandparents just one more time. This young man graduated high school at 15, went to college for a bit before dropping out to enlist in the Coast Guard, much to the chagrin of his professor father. Now, job opportunities were slim for African Americans in the Coast Guard at the time. There were only certain jobs they were allowed to do, so he had to settle for a job as a mess hall attendant. At night, armed with his trusty typewriter, like Paul in prison, he was trapped on that ship, so he started writing letters, writing letters there out on the Atlantic Ocean. He also wrote romance stories and articles about the Coast Guard hoping to be published. When the other sailors found out he could write so beautifully, they enlisted him to compose love letters to their girlfriends. He was so good that he even saved a relationship after someone had gotten a Dear John letter. After leaving the Coast Guard, he wrote for up to 18 hours a day and many rejections followed. Sometimes a story would get picked up by the Reader's Digest, but he found himself down to just 18 cents and two cans of sardines at one time, but he kept writing. In 1964, he pitched a novel about the history of his family dating back to their origins in Africa. Armed with only the misspelling of a name, Kunta Kinte, and some phrases of an unknown African language, he set out to learn more about his family tree. He tells the story that the strangest thing happened when he visited the village of Jafare in Gambia. His ancestors, has once ancestors had once lived there, and the 70 or so residents of the village welcomed him with open arms. They put him in the middle of a big circle, and they would take their kids and give them to him one by one. One by one, they were saying that we trust you and we are welcoming you back into our country. The process of writing his new book took Alex Haley 12 long years. Roots, the Saga of an American Family was published this week back in 1976. Two of my favorite Alex Haley quotes are these. Either you deal with reality or you can be sure reality is going to deal with you. And he often ended his letters with this advice, find the good and praise it. For that is how we stay rooted and grounded in love, by finding the good and praising it. It's a good practice for these weeks and the months ahead. So hear this love letter from Paul to the church at Ephesus from Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 7. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, help us to bear with one another in love, even in the most difficult of circumstance. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul has just finished praying on his knees for the people in the church at Ephesus, telling them, church, church, I get down on my knees for you. If you would only love God like you used to do, you had a love, a love you don't find every day. So don't, don't, don't let it slip away. 
Anyone ever been to Carnegie Hall in New York City? That performance will probably not get me there. Yet how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Paul is calling us to start practicing what he has been preaching for three chapters. And Paul ain't too proud to beg. He begs, he beseeches, he urges the people, please, please, please live a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Can you imagine a preacher having to beg his church to be better, to live into their calling, asking people to live out their gifts? Friends, what are the gifts that God has given you? How are you using them to serve? Don't make me beg. A member of our church, Sarah Cruz, shared with me that on the 28th of July, at the close of the worship service, we mentioned that there were Timothy bags prepared for people to pick up out in the narthex. They were there to give to those in need based on a story in Eric's sermon the week before. She picked one up and put it in the front seat of her car. On the way home from visiting her sister in Covington, she took the Avondale Patilla Memorial Drive exit to get back to her home in Decatur and immediately saw at the top of the ramp an elderly woman there begging for help. Sarah slowed down to allow the light to change to red, approached the woman, opened her window and handed her the Timothy bag filled with food and water. Sarah said, you would have thought I'd given her a million dollars. She was grinning from ear to ear. She kept thanking and blessing me over and over and over again. Sarah went on to say, the blessing and thanks do not belong to me, but to the family who put together the food package. I sort of have a dream that different families would show up each month with a set of bags for others to give away. One person puts flowers on the altar, another signs up to bring Timothy bags so that the burden is shared. Please, my friends, are you living out your calling? I beg you, will you live out your calling? I got a call the other day asking me to further live out my calling by onboarding the new bishop who starts in Western Pennsylvania on September the 1st. I guess nobody else wanted to go to Pittsburgh. I got to go back to my roots, so I checked the pirate schedule and then happily agreed since the Cubs were in town to go up there for a few days. Last year, I was given the gift of a Pittsburgh Pirate City Connect hat. My family loves that hat. It makes me easy to find in a crowd. It's bright yellow, especially at a Braves game. I really stand out. And I'm hoping that they'll be wearing their City Connect, Connect jerseys the night that I am up there. As you may remember, Pittsburgh was named for William Pitt, who was of Scottish descent. And in Scotland, they put an H at the end of Berg, originally pronounced borough, like in Edinburgh. I have to tell you, I grew up with more Bergs than any other place in the Union. There are more Bergs in Pennsylvania than any other state. There are only five here in Georgia. Can you name them? Leesburg, Sharpsburg, Whitesburg, Jen Jenkinsburg, and the toughest, Vernonsburg. When Pittsburgh was officially incorporated in 1816, their founding document was missing the H throughout. There was a typo throughout the founding document, and despite the error, almost all the local Pittsburghers kept the H when they spelled it. In 1890, seeking uniformity among Berg names, the federal government dropped the H in all the towns in the U.S. that had one, including Pittsburgh. But Pittsburgh fought back. They wanted to keep their H. They fought back for the next 21 years, a good number in Pittsburgh. And in 1911, after a big effort by the mayor, the city council, and the local postmaster, the name was formally changed to include the H. I'm glad they kept the H. For so many have dropped the H from our scripture text today. Paul says to us all, you need to go to Pittsburgh, folks. Some of us really need to go to Pittsburgh in order to bear with one another in love. You need the PGH that's on the Pittsburgh City Connect jersey. Patience, gentleness, and humility. That's what Paul says. We need patience, gentleness, and humility. That PGH is right there on their uniforms. And if you want to understand humility, be a Pirate fan. Anyone need more PGH in their life? 
Wish you saw more of it in the world? Paul tells us to take patience, gentleness, and humility to bear with one, or one another in love. So bear with me now. The church at Ephesus was a church full of differences, diverse in ethnicity and background, probably half Jew and half Gentile, each with some underlying assumptions that their viewpoint was superior. So Paul has to say to them, patience, gentleness, and humility, friends. Time to go to Pittsburgh? Want to join me? To bear with one or another in love and maintain the unity of the church despite our differences. And if I have to beg, I will. Last Saturday, we hosted the funeral of Earl Donaldson in the chapel. His dad had been an usher here during integration. In those days, they actually had a discussion about who would be welcome in this church. Can you imagine that? What would they do when the first black person came to church here? A heated discussion ensued with little PGH to be found. The suggestion was made to keep extra chairs in the back so that when visitors came, they could be seated in those chairs. But Earl's dad stood up and said, we will do no such thing. Anyone who comes here seeking God will be seated in these pews. And that was the end of the discussion as they sought to bear with one another in love. Most of his adult life, Earl taught communication classes with the Dale Carnegie course. And as I sat there at that funeral, I started to wonder how Dale Carnegie and the famous Pittsburgher Andrew Carnegie were related. You may remember Andrew Carnegie's story. He came to the U.S. to avoid poverty and squalor in his native Scotland. Pittsburgh wasn't much better. As a 12-year-old, to help his family, he got a job at a local cotton factory as a bobbin boy, earning just $1.20 a week, changing spools of thread. And as a boy, he was most grateful for Colonel James Anderson, who let young apprentices and working boys borrow books from his personal library once a week. Carnegie later said, access to books. The access that Anderson provided to books changed his life. He said this, to him I owe a taste for literature, which I would not exchange for all the millions that were ever amassed by man. When Andrew Carnegie, over the course of his life, amassed a fortune of over $350 million, he used it to build nearly 1,700 public libraries just here in the U.S. Because someone had opened a door and a book for him, he used his gifts to bless countless others. Carnegie was also a big church organ enthusiast, donating 7,600 organs to churches and music halls. We even have our Andrew Carnegie to thank for Sesame Street. For in the 1960s, the Carnegie Corporation used some of those funds to research how television might be used to help educate kids, especially underprivileged children, and Sesame Street was born. Can you tell me how to get, how to, get to Sesame Street? It's not practice, practice, practice but by a generosity that looks to others. Andrew Carnegie believed you should spend the first half of your life in education, first third of your life in education, the second third acquiring wealth, and the last third giving it all away, famously saying, the man who dies thus rich dies disgraced. Andrew Carnegie died on this day in August 1990 after giving it all away. I think he took Jesus' words about wealth seriously. He wanted his tombstone to include the H of humility. His epitaph that he wrote for himself was a man who knew how to enlist his services better into his service better men than himself. His wishes were not upheld and his grave marker is a simple Celtic cross bearing his name, birthplace, and lifespan. Turns out Dale Carnegie, author of How to Win Friends and Influence People, wasn't related to Andrew Carnegie at all. The story is told that Dale was speaking at Carnegie Hall in New York City and decided to change the spelling of his name to match the spelling of Andrew Carnegie's so he could be associated with the generous philanthropist. In baptism, we take on the name of Christ as those who follow Jesus in patience, gentleness, and humility, using the gifts we have been given to live out our callings. Now back to Earl Donaldson. His daughter Colleen shared some of the lessons that Earl taught from Dale Carnegie, and she remembered this one. It was the first one that he taught, the first lesson. 
and it was one of his favorites. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. It will take some serious PGH for that, right? Earl invited his students to try it for a week. Try a week without criticizing, condemning, or complaining. And then they were asked to report back to see how they did. He loved hearing their stories, rooted in love, patience, gentleness, and humility. He then quoted to them Dale Carnegie, who said, Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, and most fools do. He shared other lessons like these. Give honest and sincere appreciation. Become genuinely interested in other people and smile. And to quote Dolly Parton again, she said, if someone isn't smiling, just give them yours. So friends, will you go to Pittsburgh this week? Patience, gentleness, and humility. Back in 1979 in Pittsburgh, they called the late Willie Stargell Pops because of his leadership both on and off the baseball field. When Stargell led the Pittsburgh Pirates to their second World Series title later that decade, the name the team was nicknamed was The Family because of their close relationships. Stargell said, we won, we lived, and we enjoyed as one. We modeled together, we molded together dozens of different individuals into one working force. We were products of different races. We were raised in different income bra brackets. But in the clubhouse and on the field, we were one. We are family, echoed across Three River Stadium and the whole city. Paul wants the Jews and Gentiles in this church in Ephesus to sing, we are family. We are family because we are one in Christ Jesus. Yes, we have our differences, but we are one in Christ. And Paul reminds us all to be one seven times, one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. One pops of us all. I've seen patience, gentleness, and humility at the Olympics this week. Have you? When Brasilia, Brazilian Larissa Pimenta and Italian Odette Gifreda faced off for a bronze medal in women's 52-kilogram judo, Larissa was very emotional after winning the fight. She collapsed, but she got comforted by her Italian opponent. Even though they were from different countries, Gifreda had earlier come to know Christ through Larissa. So when Larissa was emotional and couldn't pick herself off the, off the floor, her opponent, who had lost, went and she, because she was rooted and grounded in love. And she hugged the victor and said to her, Get up, get up, give God the glory, give him the glory. So even if you won't come to Pittsburgh with me, you can always try love here in the ATL. Always try love. Rooted and grounded in love. Bearing with one another in love is the best way to win friends and influence people, according to Paul and Jesus. So find the good and praise it, I beg you. Choose patience, gentleness, and humility, or ATL, over and over and over again this week. Amen.